So <laughs> we are good to go. Everyone, this is the Battle of the Five Podcasters. Um, Joanna, you you were going to, and I want to move on to this whole piece, because Dave, you also have another that ties into this. You have another podcast, the EO, the Entrepreneur's Podcast, that is EO 360, that is a huge podcast. Um, and there's two things in here. One, the conversation you and Joanna were having through our WhatsApp group about entrepreneurship and the association community. And two, the post that was just on, and Ben, you alluded to this, or you mentioned this earlier, um, evaluating the success of your podcast and whether or not you're accomplishing what you're trying to accomplish, right? Is it just listeners to you? Is it translating into business, et cetera? I think there's a huge window that people look through when they try to figure out whether or not their podcast is quote unquote successful, right? Which all for me, I'm going to start and just say, for me, it just goes back to, do I feel like whether I have, you know, 18, 180 or 1800 listeners on an episode, do I feel like I put good information in the community that will get referenced for those who and findable for those who really need that information? And I can't focus too much on the listenership only because it seems to be such a roller coaster episode to episode of who listens. And that could be a function of so many things besides topic or my hosting. So the two things here, entrepreneur and association, the conversation you're having, and how does that tie into, well, that doesn't, we'll get to the other part later. So you want to talk about entrepreneurship as yeah. it relates to yeah. this? What were you, you, and, actually... you and Joanna, Joanna a yeah. conversation going? So I alluded to this earlier, uh, I, Joanna mentioned that she had just released this episode with Sandra Nam from uh, Kiko Chat. And so I listened to that episode over the weekend. And uh, it's it's really interesting to hear Sandra's journey in creating this, um, this platform she has, uh, which she calls a marketplace. Uh, and then a, a big part of the podcast was saying, so what is this again? Like, how does it how does what problem does it solve and how does it fit into the marketplace how does it compare to um uh, something like uh, andy's uh, insight guide um what do you call those what's in what's insight guide like a buyer's it's a, guide it's a market it's a buyer's, buyer's guide. guide yeah yeah it's buyer's in, guide that's the word i was looking yeah. for and she's like yeah it's like a buyer's guide and on on steroids so it, but it, what really piqued my interest was this her journey of trying to find product market fit. And I don't know that she has, I don't know that she hasn't, but I don't know. It's sometimes hard to define or to realize when you've hit product market fit because I think there's a lot of varying definitions of it. But he, I know as entrepreneurs, we're all very, very focused. I know I am very focused on product market fit, which essentially is like, when do you know you've actually solved a relevant problem with all and and how do you know that you've got the right product <laughs> buying or product for the market that you're serving you know this is something that i think associations need to be thinking about more in terms of releasing um driving revenue they all associations think about revenue like the fact that it's nonprofit doesn't matter every association's thinking about revenue in terms of dues the conference engagement in terms of our conference tickets and in terms of um, certifications. And then you look at uh, an episode that uh, Tom and I did in Association Strong with Todd Hopley, uh, who is the CEO of uh, AAAE, American Asso Association of Airport Executives, I mentioned him earlier. And this guy, uh, I can't say single-handedly, he wouldn't say that either, but he led the organization from 30 million, 27 million actually to 107 million in five years. And by the way, Joanna, thank you for that introduction to Todd. And then, and now it's at 130 million. Mm -hmm. And we can go into the details of where all that money's coming from, but less than 2% of it comes from member dues. So he's an example of somebody I think that is running that organization like a business, thinking about it like an entrepreneur. Hence also his title of CEO as opposed to executive director, which is a more progressive definition of the same role. So anyway, that's that's a topic I think is really, really interesting. And I don't think association leadership is educated enough on the topic of product market fit. 
Well, if you think about it, every association has to constantly reinvent itself. I mean, I think we in the for-profit sector, I mean, we're explicit about it, right? I, I have told my team I'm in a period of reinvention right now, like, you know, hang on for the ride. And the question is how many associations and nonprofits think that way too? Like, you know, maybe they need to be CEOs, chief entrepreneurship officers, right? And thinking about like, how do we ingest or how do we kind of infuse our organizations with new ideas that are relevant to, to what our, our members need and how do we test out ideas? I mean, like you all are probably doing this. We're constantly doing this. I'm constantly in conversation with clients about ideas and some things fall completely flat and then we go, well, that sounded like a good idea, but you know, clearly there's no market for it. And then other times you hit the jackpot and you think, okay, I have something new that I can, that I now can offer to my clients, but our associations thinking explicitly that way about the new conference, about the new research, about the new certification. So oh, experimentation is such a huge part of it because you can yeah. come out with a product that you think is amazing, like absolutely amazing, and nobody buys it. Absolutely. Or, or your mother buys it and a couple of friends buy it, and then they, they don't buy it a second time. And and, and that's, Ben, you alluded to the, the startup of Prop Fuel back in the day. That's what happened with our company. We started a business where my partner and I thought the product was awesome, and it actually worked well, but it didn't really solve a big enough problem for people to want to buy it. And so we transitioned and pivoted, as you would say, in the entrepreneurship world. And that's what uh, that's what Sandra from Kiko Chat is doing. That's what you're talking about right now. We all do it. And the question is, are associations experimenting enough so that they stumble upon the right products that make them real money? Speaking of experiment- Dave, I don't think it's just about money. I, I'm not sure that I agree with that. If you listen to my Jennifer well, I didn't Grill say episode. Just, I didn't say just about money. Money is the measure. But it has to be best, where they invest their time and money. Well, I think it goes back to measurement though, right? Like if you can measure the consumption, because one thing that associations do very well, I suppose, in a lot of cases, but just more than anyone else is they generate content, right? Whether it's professional development and and so on and so on and so on. But are they measuring like the consumption of that, then measuring the value and then saying, is this something they should get or is it something they should pay for in addition to, and some of that, like that measurement, because you can tinker all you want. And I might look at somebody across the street and say, oh, that's a great car. I would buy that car. But would I really? Did I? I I'm curious to hear, <laughs> Joanna. I, I interrupted you. I'm sorry, but I, I just want to clarify the the money to me is the ultimate measurement of product market fit. So I'm curious why you think it's not uh, ultimately doesn't come down to the revenue. Well, it ultimately has to come down to revenue, but like I just had an amazing interview with Jennifer Abril from SACMA. So, so what was interesting about that was she said, we've had, we're doubling down on B2B marketing services. And she said they have something called lead sheets where anybody from from outside can actually sit down with a SOCMA staff person and fill out a lead sheet that's been QA'd and then it gets sent out to the members. And she said that from their definition, it's been almost 300 leads that have gone to members and about 54% have actually gone to members. And I said, are you charging for this? And she said, no, but it's driving membership. The yeah, other so thing they are she charging said for was, it. It's called membership dues. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, 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 absolutely. For, yeah. But it's not necessarily the quote non-dues revenue. And then the other thing that she said was fascinating was she said they sold their trade show several years ago because it was taking up too much time. It was overwhelming the organization and they sold it, you know, for, for a huge sum. But she said then something was lost in the industry. The members for a decade said, we wish we had the show back because it was the kind of the safe space for us to gather and find partners. So they waited out the non-compete and brought and bought another show. So again, they thought it was all about revenue, but it was about where the, where the, where the industry gathers. So they brought it back. I, Very I, I interesting. Think you're, I think I still, I think we're both saying the same thing. Ultimately, I agree. the final measurement though is dues revenue. And if they're not providing that connection, as Kiki said in the chat here, that the, the the connection for their members and there's not enough value, people won't renew. And they brought that back, not because they missed the dues, the, the revenue from the conference. They brought it back because it was providing member value 
and therefore There's, driving yeah, yeah. renewals of dues. And also then as a trade show being a successful trade show that drives revenue. So everything is kind of working together, but it was interesting yeah. that they had to come back to that place. What a fun moment though, to say when, when maybe the conference gets a little too expensive and you get to look back because not everybody gets this chance. You just struggle through it. And they say, yeah, I know it's expensive, but remember we, we lost it last time, right? Like, right. Let's, let, let's, let's not give it away again. Cause if, if we drive price down, this becomes a burden for the organization again, and it goes away. We already did that once. So everybody pony up, right? If the value is there, let's make sure that we're pricing it and valuing it appropriately. And most people don't get a chance to do that in their business. Ah, right. What, when, what, what they're doing though, is this is experimenting. Experimenting isn't just trying new things, but experimenting might be cutting things too. It's all about value, whatever, mm -hmm. no matter what it is, value has to outweigh cost for people to continue to participate or, or be engaged. And that's all three of you said it. So the measurement might be revenue, or it might be meeting your expectations because the revenue might not really contribute to the financial you know, glory of the organization, but did you meet your expectations? Because some some organizations have more philanthropic or um, I don't want to say loftier because it sounds, but they, they have goals around things that are basic human needs, right? A purpose. As, they have yes, a purpose, right? They have a, they have a mission that's aligned with something other than, so completing that is part of the entrepreneurial perspective of experimenting whether it leads to a lot of money or a completion of a thing is definitely the measure of success in my in my opinion. One of the arguments that I've been hearing in the space is just in the industry is just about this. We need to be reminded about the dues revenue. We need to be reminded about, it is about the member value um, in that circling all the way back to our initial discussion about why are some of these, um, what is it, the member what do we call it? Membership cliffs or something happening? The membership cliff, right? Membership cliff. Why is this happening? Um, one of the big discussions is that there's been so much of a focus on bringing the money to the mission, right? Like no money, no mission and all of that with associations. There's been so much of a focus on acting like commercial enterprises that um, there's been a, a loss of the, the importance around the value of membership as it pertains to belonging, community, a lot of the decision making has been centered around this this idea of well, we we need to operate more like a business, and so and I know that that's something that the pendulum swings back and forth as far as how the philosophy in the industry is, you know, the prevailing thought on on how we should think about this. But uh, Michael Tatanetti actually brought up. Um, and he said, I want to focus guy. more. What's that? Pricing Pri guy. That's yeah. how I know him, the pricing guy. Yep. The yep. pricing guy. Yeah. Michael Tatanetti said, um, I want to focus. Yes, non dues revenue is very exciting and important, but I think we need to focus on the dues revenue because I think that a lot of a lot of what's missing and a lot of what people aren't getting from their associations anymore is where the value is in the actual the dues. Why? What are we the paying dues for? Why? Why are we members of this association versus part just getting something from a for profit? You know, why does this? Why is this different? I was going to bring up briefly, and this is probably a whole episode in itself. But uh, I've always kind of looked from afar and said, "Well, associations are actually." very much like software companies, like a SaaS company in that they have that recurring membership revenue. And then the non dues revenue is sort of the implementation versus the SaaS. And um, it, it is very interesting because you have to stay vigilant, even as a SaaS company, to make sure there continues to be value, good support, all those things. And I used to very much subscribe to, and there's cases made on all sides, but for the sake of argument, like I like the idea of tinkering and kind of adding or removing things from membership and allowing for more add-ons for a number of reasons, but it allows people to have a bit more of an ad hoc approach, lower the barrier of entry to make sure you get that recurring still, and then allow people to scale up. But I also, as a someone that's just a lifetime kind of sales study over here, the alternate choice close 
of how do I want to engage with this organization uh, is, is I think so important too, um, because it's not whether I want to, you know, be involved or not. It's like, how do I want path A or path B? Right. Um, but to hear Kiki, to hear that you're, the conversation you were having was like, we have to refocus back on membership. It is the most forecastable. It is the most financially valuable. I mean, the fact that these are nonprofits, are they able to get owned by private equity? Because if so, they would have, you know, valuation multiples like the software companies in our space. And yet that's not their goal, right? To get sold, if you will, right? It's, it's about the idea that we have to stay on top of, you know, the value within our recurring. When we're building our software companies and creating value and figuring out how we do that, like are the associations as vigilant about adding or removing a feature? as we are in our software. Are they right? experimenting, right? That's, that's, I mean, that's, we're getting at the same thing, which is really about experimenting with the, the ultimate value proposition. Right. Yeah. And I like SAS the way the analogy what I want to bring there up. of okay. adding features, right? Cause you can do that without doing a whole new version, right? Of membership. You can add a feature to it and see how it goes. So maybe that's the answer to the question, Ben. You started the thread of how can associations take what, what we just talked about and experiment, as you're, you're saying, Dave, Will, as part of the maybe. entrepreneurial side? Because entrepreneurs are different. We got to keep in mind, right? There's a difference. Like I consider myself a business owner, frankly, more than an entrepreneur. I'm not recreating the way an old business used to work. Dave, you're the EO guy, right? So you're the EO person who really knows the definition of entrepreneur, but I, I always think of it as somebody who's inventing something new where me, this company, Delcor, right? We're, we're consulting and we're also improving MSP services in the space. We're, we're making them better. Is that an entrepreneur? I don't know. I don't really care. I'm not going to get wrapped around the axle about the word, but associations have a core mission and vision and they have business objectives. They probably shouldn't be incredibly entrepreneurial to mess with that mission, but they should be tinkering and adding features to experiment and increase value. Maybe that's the, the way I would take a look at it. So the, the experimentation is certainly around features and benefits, but it's also around how they're communicated. That's a product market fit. You can have the right product, and if you're not communicating it well to the market so they're not buying it, then it's a fail. And so you got to have the right product, you got to have the right market, and you need to communicate that correctly. And that's what makes it such a balancing act is if you have the right product and nobody's buying it, is it because of the messaging or is it because of the product? Or is it because you're selling it to the wrong people? So it's very, very difficult, this whole product market fit thing. It's really, really hard, which makes it kind of Maybe this fun, is a good topic for the five of us to have a product market fit guest on with us and focus on it with an association exec too, and do a pot around that. Hmm. Every, everyone is nodding. Can you hear I, that I think everyone? That's a great idea. That sounds <laughs> like <Yeah>. fun. <laughs>